Good afternoon. Thanks for being here today uh, for our 12-7 briefing. Just uh, kind of one housekeeping note to kick it off. It, when we started these briefings, we, uh, we set up weekly briefings for four weeks, and then we were going to reassess what the frequency of these need to be. We're going to continue having these every week, this time at 1.30 for the foreseeable future. So uh, you can kind of plan on that on a regular basis. Uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, have a few brief remarks on the data here, uh, talk a little bit about a couple council actions that we'll see on Tuesday night, and then I'm going to turn the uh, majority of the time over to uh, Jill and uh, the mics here today. So uh, kind of to start, uh, as we always do, I like to look at our, our cases. And now I'm going to put a big asterisk on this case chart today because I think it's really important that we talk about um, the percent positive rate that we continue to see that's extremely high. And so even though we've seen this, this gradual uh, downward trend, even with this number uh, here in our MSA, uh, I think the positivity rate today was still in the 40s, right? So um, I honestly don't take too much comfort in this, seeing a downward trend, because uh, the positivity rate is still extremely high. But that being, that being said, uh, obviously taking out the Thanksgiving Day uh, trend there, there is a little bit of a downward trend in the number of cases that we're, we've seen in the region. Um, but that positivity rate is still quite uh, almost unacceptable, I would say. So uh, when people see this, I think they get a little bit of, of uh, comfort. Uh, but it's also, to me, um, you can take about any data point you want in this pandemic um, and create about any story you want. And so it's always important that you look at several different data points when you're looking at how we're doing as a region. Uh, from a hospitalization standpoint, uh, as our partners will attest here in a little bit, we saw a, a bit of a downtick last week, a little bit higher census yet today. Uh, but that's obviously a trend uh, that we like to see as well uh, here in Sioux Falls. I think, uh, I believe that the, uh, the healthcare systems will each report kind of on, on their individual census numbers as well. Um, but the key here is that even when you're uh, at a 160 level uh, for a week between our two healthcare systems here in Sioux Falls, still a very tense level. That's still a very, very busy level um, of care that they're providing. So uh, as we shared last week, I'm going to probably just always pound the podium on this. The, the diligence that we have to have right now can't be overstated. Uh, and I say that because there is there's a little bit of uh, reason for optimism and positivity on the horizon with uh, all the talk about the vaccination. And Jill's going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, my continued concern with that is just the community relaxation that starts to happen with that optimistic messaging. And uh, the, you know, the truth of the matter is we're still several months away from that vaccine being available to John Q. Citizen. And so that's why the diligence of the mask wearing and all the other measures that you all know by now are just as important as they've always been, uh, if not more important. So on Tuesday night at our council meeting, we're gonna have uh, a first reading to look at extending our current mask uh, ordinance, facial cover ordinance that we have in our city. That will then go, assuming it passes tomorrow night, which I believe it will, to a second reading on the 15th. Uh, and uh, the reading uh, calls for that mandate to be extended through, uh, through March. And so based on what uh, I kind of see and understand right now, I do uh, believe that will likely pass our city council tomorrow uh, and then again on the 15th, but we'll see what happens. But that's something that will uh, be coming up in our meeting tomorrow. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn over my time, uh, the rest of my time, to Jill Franken. Jill's our public health director, and she's going to talk a little bit about uh, the vaccine and some of the vaccine information that we're starting to, uh, uh, it's starting to be made more clear, quite frankly, to us here in the city. So, Jill. Thanks, Mayor. Appreciate it. You know, we're certainly encouraged by, you know, the data that uh, Mayor Tenhaken shared uh, in those slides uh, previous. Uh, it is certainly, though, uh, because of the efforts of this community, and those efforts must continue, uh, it's really important uh, that we take into account what the CDC has shared with us. You know, they put out a new uh, set of guidance uh, last week, and in that came a graphic that I think makes a lot of sense. It really includes many of the things we already know about, but it does in particular highlight a couple things that are, you know, that new and emerging 
tool uh, or set of tools in our toolbox. So think of all of these as all the components of things we need to be doing right now, not just one or two or three, but really taking into account every single one of these when you're looking at your behaviors, your activities, things that you're doing that can help mitigate the spread of this virus, especially to our vulnerable populations. You know, so in particular, really that consideration of whether or not to travel right now is one that's uh, of particular importance. And, uh, and again, you know, they talk about um, high risk groups, but they also include then healthcare workers. And I think that the two gentlemen that'll be coming after me can attest to the fact that our healthcare workers in particular need to be protected right now and, uh, and, and, and that we need to keep them healthy and able to do their jobs. And then, you know, really it's up to all of us right now to educate ourselves on the COVID vaccines that are gonna be coming available very, very soon um, in our communities, um, at least to those that are able to get them in that very, very first round of vaccine delivery. And so really start going on that CDC website and educating yourselves as individuals. Um, and don't wait for someone to educate you on it, but be reaching out to those reliable sources. And I would really point you towards the CDC as the reliable source uh, for that information. And so with regard to that, um, when we talk about vaccines, you're gonna hear me in particular talking more and more about that at these press conferences going forward. I'm pretty excited that we are actually at that point where we're gonna start seeing vaccine in our state and in our community. Um, it's time for us to be doing that level of public health work um, in partnership with our health system, certainly or who are gonna do a lot of the heavy lifting and they'll talk more about that, I'm sure. Um, but there's a number of questions that, you know, in public health, that's a lot of what we do as well as provide education and information. And, you know, we're hearing questions. And so I'm going to just share a couple of those with you. And, you know, one is really who's evaluating this vaccine for safety and uh, um, efficacy or effectiveness. And it really is the FDA that's in charge of that process um, of approving vaccines, especially for that emergency use authorization that you hear so much about. They're the ones that are meeting uh, even yet this week on the Pfizer vaccine and next week for the Moderna vaccine. And they will be the ones that will identify uh, those emergency youth authorizations. You probably heard of some other countries that have already issued um, those approvals and uh, we will soon be doing so, it sounds like, in our, in our uh, United States as well. And then how do the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention determine who receives the initial allocations um, of vaccine? And that's something that the Center for Disease Control or their group called ACIP, um, they're the group that are going to be and have been wrestling with um, who is gonna get that vaccine uh, first, second, third, et cetera. They're doing so under a set of principles, and I talked a little bit about this last week, um, but that's getting more attention in the media as of late, um, because I understand that there's actually gonna be a specific task force looking at at least one of these principles. And the first one is really maximizing benefits and minimizing harm. That's a very important principle that, they'll be ta that they've taken into consideration um, with how to allocate this vaccine. So the other one is promoting justice, and then along with that, mitigating health inequities. And that's where we're gonna see a task force that's um, at the federal level emerging to really guide on making sure that there's equitable um, uh, a distribution of this vaccine to the populations, especially those who've been hardest hit with the COVID virus. And then also promoting transparency, making sure that all the decisions that are being made by this group and the CDC are transparent and able to be shared with the public. So who will be offered the initial allocation of vaccines? Well, it's really our very, very frontline health work care workers right now. They're gonna identify exactly how many doses, like they have an idea of how many doses they're gonna be getting. And so they're in the process right now of saying, who are those individuals in our healthcare organizations that are going to be receiving that? And then long-term care staff, you know, will also be in that very, very first tier. And then um, along with that, in the up upcoming allocations will also be healthcare residents. So it's really, really a matter of identifying how much vaccine we are receiving um, and then their ability to identify who those populations are within those tiers that have been recommended or those um, priorities that have been recommended. 
So, you know, more to come on that because I think next week we'll probably have a lot more information to share. And we want to be a partner with the health systems in making sure that information gets out to all of you in this community so you're well informed about that and other aspects of this vaccination um, and this program and this process so that you feel comfortable when it's your turn to get vaccinated. So again, be well, stay safe. Um, please continue to educate yourself. And at this point, I think I'll turn it over to Dr. Michael Elliott. He's the Chief Medical Officer for Avera McKinnon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Franken. Um, thanks to uh, Mayor Ten Aiken, too, for having the uh, press conference this afternoon and inviting folks from the health systems to be here. This won't come as a surprise to any of you. Avera McKinnon continues to be uh, very busy. Uh, we're taking care of uh, all of our patients, COVID and non-COVID. As an example, we've got about three times our normal capacity of critical care patients in our hospital. Um, we've done this by upstaffing critical care physicians, our hospitalists, our critical care trained nurses, pharmacists, and others. Uh, our staff has done, in my humble opinion, an amazing job, an amazing job of finding ways to provide top-notch care to patients that need us. The number of new cases, the number of hospitalizations may be flattening as, as the mayor's slide suggests, but a fair number of our COVID positive patients are needing prolonged stays in the hospital, two, three, four weeks and more. Uh, as such, um, the hospital numbers continue to be very, very high. I'd like to lift up a couple of our programs, the Avera at Home program and the COVID hotline. Together, they're taking care of connecting with more than 1,400 patients with COVID in their home. Imagine, imagine if even 10% of those folks needed to be in our hospital. Um, what a different outlook we could have. So uh, they're just doing an amazing job. Uh, speaking of the COVID hotline, um, I want you to know you can call this line and you can get expert advice on symptom management, when to call your primary care physician, when to go to one of our sample collection sites to, uh, to have a test. You know, our sample collection site um, uh, for a while was seeing north of 500 uh, patients a day. Uh, lately, it's been down in the 3, 350 range. Uh, but in a drive-through environment where they can do sample collections on six cars at a time, we're very, very efficient with that. In addition, our Avera laboratories here in Sioux Falls very early on in this pandemic stood up the ability to do a tremendous number of COVID tests right here in Sioux Falls. So we didn't have to send them out to further locations. That means our turnaround time is, is very, very good. And through all of this, you, we've used PCR tests. That's the gold standard of tests for COVID right now. Gives us our best sensitivity and our best specificity so you can rely on the accuracy of the tests that you get from an Avera facility. As the mayor said and Director Franken said, you know, there are some, there, there's some positives here. The vaccine is coming. And so far the data is very, very reassuring. It appears to be both safe and effective, thank goodness, right? Um, we have the monoclonal antibodies. You've probably all heard about those. Uh, Vera was fortunate enough, our researchers um, were a part of a study with the Regeneron monoclonal antibody uh, well before it even got its emergency use authorization. As such, we are stood up very, very well to distribute this to any one of our patients that may be uh, in need of it that qualifies for it. Avera is working with the state of South Dakota and surrounding states, with our partners at Sanford and Monument, with our partners with the city of Sioux Falls. Um, we want to create the absolute best plans so that we can safely, efficiently, and equitably give this vaccine to as many people as we can as quickly as we can. 
that's our commitment to all of you. And uh, I guarantee you, we have multiple, multiple teams working on this uh, seven days a week. I also want to assure you, you, you've likely heard that the vaccines have gone through an accelerated process of approval. It's important for you to understand what the real acceleration has been, and that's been in the manufacturing of these vaccines. Most companies aren't going to start to mass produce a vaccine until it has been approved by the FDA and thoroughly evaluated by the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. This time, with the COVID vaccine, Pfizer, Moderna, and others have been incentivized to mass produce these vaccines even before they have been approved. Again, as, as Director Franken said, the FDA is meeting uh, December 10th, I believe, to discuss the Pfizer vaccine. Even before it's received approval from the FDA, Pfizer has already been mass producing the vaccine. That way, once it does receive approval from the FDA, they will be able to very quickly get it to us and we will be able to very quickly get it to folks. So again, you can be confident in the safety and the efficacy data that is coming out. The other thing Director Franken said, and it's great that I get to follow you, Jill, because you make all my points for me. Thank you for that. Um, is that the vaccine is a tool in our toolbox. It is not the catch-all, the end-all, be-all, the magic bullet, whatever we'd like it to be. It is going to take some time to get enough people vaccinated. Tens of millions of people are going to need to be vaccinated, really, before we can really start to see an impact. Maybe as many as 200 million people in the United States are going to need to be vaccinated before we are at a point where we can consider uh, herd immunity. So it's coming, thankfully. It will help, but it isn't enough by itself. The monoclonal antibodies, the other clinical pearls we've developed, the masking, the hand hygiene, the social distancing, all those other things that we have been talking to you about since the very beginning. And so many of you have been willing to accept and, and, and um, partake in. Uh, those are the things that are going to make the real difference. Those are the things that hopefully will decrease the impact of uh, any gatherings for Thanksgiving that will decrease the impact of any social gatherings over Christmas and as we enter the first couple of months of 2021. So for all of your efforts, for everything you're doing, for all of the sacrifices you're making, thank you. It is going to make a difference. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Wilde. Uh, thanks, Dr. Elliott, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I would lead off with my comments will be very brief, as Dr. Elliott alluded to, following Jill, following him. There's, I'll, I'll try to be really to the point of uh, just a few things to lift up here. Um, so currently with uh, Sanford, we're seeing about 70 to 90 uh, COVID patients inpatient on a daily basis. That has come down just a little bit, uh, but still uh, uh, continues to be a very dynamic number. Uh, people seeking us with, uh, unfortunately, uh, illness due to the pandemic, which is, of course, very serious. And uh, we'll get into just a little bit about the optimism in the future. Uh, we continue uh, to be very busy with other healthcare needs as well. Our staff continues to work very hard and we're very proud of everything that everyone is doing. Very thankful uh, for the staff to be there uh, for all of us and uh, doing a very nice job. Um, we're continuing to evaluate the impact, uh, if any, hopefully not, of the Thanksgiving holiday. And uh, so uh, should have some clarity on that this week as the timing of uh, infections rolls out here and uh, watching that closely, hoping uh, for some good news there. Uh, there's been some reports regarding our intensive care unit capacity at Sanford, and we'll just address that very briefly in that uh, we've identified some opportunity with the state of South Dakota in the reporting of that. 
um, and that will be corrected going forward. We're going to watch that very closely just so that we're providing the most accurate information. Uh, we, we do have bed availability, staff availability, and uh, continue to work hard within our surge plan to maintain that, and, and that has been the case uh, as we've gone through. Uh, some allusion to vaccine and vaccine distribution. Uh, we too are working very closely with great partners in the city of Sioux Falls, uh, the state of South Dakota, the federal government, and all the states where Sanford has a presence and uh, working closely with our partners at Avera Monument, Mobridge, Watertown to provide equitable, transparent uh, vaccine distribution when that becomes available, hopefully very soon. Uh, regarding the safety of the vaccine, uh, we certainly are very optimistic as we've seen over 30,000 people receive this vaccine in the clinical trials thus far. Uh, it appears to have a very favorable safety profile and as we have heard the reports as well, very uh, efficacious. And uh, as Dr. Elliott alluded to as well, it's going to be a tool that hopefully should provide optimism going forward as we deal with the pandemic. Uh, like Dr. Elliott pointed out, uh, it's going to take a lot of vaccination in order to get toward that herd immunity. The latest estimate, I believe, from the federal government was around 70% of the population getting vaccinated. That's not going to happen quickly, but it's going to happen pretty quickly as, uh, as we've had experience with vaccines in the past. This one's uh, going to move pretty rapidly, and we're optimistic about that. While that occurs, we're still going to need to really take care of ourselves. Flu shots are available, and I strongly encourage anyone who has not received that to please do so. Um, we're seeing good uh, minimal numbers in regarding influenza right now and would really like to keep it that way. Um, also, really have talked before about addressing mental health needs, addressing your primary care needs as well, and please continue to do that. People are getting out, they're exercising, this great weather coming in, please continue to take advantage of that. Keep up the good work. Uh, it does get fatiguing, we've talked about that before, but people are, are, are getting after it and it's much appreciated. Um, with that, I'd also uh, just really remind everyone too that as we talk about vaccine, as we talk about antibody infusions, which we're doing also at Sanford, and have seen a, a fair number of people uh, receiving that treatment. We're also rolling that out to our uh, network sites as well, as well as long-term care. So that's gonna be really widely available. Another great tool, uh, hopefully in the, in the fight against this pandemic. But really it it's, comes down to this slide as well. It's, it's the things we've been talking about. Be smart, be thoughtful, every moment matters. Um, unfortunately, probably do need to talk about those Christmas travel plans, holiday travel plans, gathering plans, things of that nature. What makes sense for your family at this moment? Uh, so with that, I'll wrap it up.